May I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Anyone like trivia? Mm-hmm. Great. Let's play a game of church trivia for just a minute. I'm expecting you to call out answers. Church trivia. So you don't have to stay quiet because someone might know the answer to this question. Even Scott's allowed to play the game. Um, The biblical story of the transfiguration occurs twice a year in the lectionary. I don't think there's any other story that actually occurs twice in the lectionary. Certainly nothing as momentous as the transfiguration. So it occurs this week on August 6th, so we've transferred it to today. When else? Do we, do, the, do, we t- do the transfiguration on Christ the King? Okay, it c- occurs three times in the lectionary. <laughs> Smarty pants. <laughs> I'll be fact checking you. Um, so three times in the lectionary, maybe more, maybe I'm wrong, maybe the story is so important it just keeps happening. What is the time in my head that I was wondering about if we could remember? That's the Ascension, that's in May, which is up there on the Raridas. It's our feast day. Um, to, not to keep you in suspense, it happens on the last Sunday of Epiphany. And it makes perfect sense, right? It's the perfect day for that to happen because this is the end of the season of Epiphany. We have a theophany. Right? This is like how we go out on a high note before we go down into the valley of Lent. We have this literal high note up on top of a mountain. <coughs> you know, it, and it's weird because why, why would it happen at all on August 6th? This is a random date, I thought, and then I had to go out and do some more trivia and find out why. Um, and the reason, it just has to do with politics. So in the mid-15th century, there was a war. They demolished some Turks or somebody. The Pope got excited, and he said, this is a perfect opportunity to assign the transfiguration to this date. I think it's kind of ho-hum, personally. Kind of a ho-hum reason to celebrate one of the strangest moments in the life of Christ is to assign it and attach it to a political victory. But I didn't get to make the decisions. So that's that's all the trivia. Hopefully. (laughs) So the transfiguration, though, of the fleshly body of Jesus Christ, it helps us to see that God intends for us, us fleshy folk, to also be transformed in real and concrete ways. God made bodies, and they're good, and they're holy. It shows us that it isn't enough to just be made in the image of God as if we were all stamped out in an image of God factory somewhere, kind of one of us after another like tin soldiers. Instead, we are to be remade and formed and transformed and transfigured over the course of time and even into eternity through grace, more and more into the likeness of God. So one church father compared it to this. Imagine that God is like an artist who draws a sketch. That is how we are made in the image of God, just a line drawing. But over time, the artist fills in the sketch with color and depth and texture. In the beginning, that simple line drawing could be almost anyone. It's kind of generic, right? But the finished product is definitely unmistakably you and becomes in the end also the likeness of God. This is the the course of the Christian life as we develop through grace more and more into what God meant for us to be. So God as the artist, he's not starting with us as like a model posing for a portrait, hoping that he'll get it right and more or less it'll start to look like us And then in the end, God judges whether or not the portrait is any good, right? How well did God capture this image? It's completely the other way around. Each of us is made from the imagination and the love of the heart of God. 
and when God has, through grace, made us each complete. Quite often, that's not going to happen in this lifetime, which is good news. We're not done. Remember, there was a poster when I was a kid that said, God don't make junk. Mm -hmm. He ain't finished with me yet. Mm -hmm. Those are like 10 words or so to just put in your pocket on a bad day. God didn't make junk. He ain't finished with me yet. (laughs) So instead, we should see that um, in the end, when we are finally complete in God, God the artist will sit back. And just like in the beginning, he will say, this thing, this beautiful creature I've made is good. It's the goodness of God. So we see this in the transfiguration, that even the Son of God is transformed. So I know it might seem like kind of a theological game, right, to like try to draw these facts and imaginings out of this story, but it's not. See, incarnational embodiment is central to our relationship with God and with one another. Christian life is not just a head game. It's about the really real. And the really real ties together things heavenly and things earthly, which is why the Son of God is both divine and human, both things. So, of course, the story of the Transfiguration is not just a one-sided story. It's not only about what God is doing in the body of Christ. The disciples are not just lying there in their beds having visions. Remember, our religion is not a head game. Incarnational embodiment is central to our relationship with God. So Peter and company have journeyed up a mountain to be with Jesus while he prays, likely a common occurrence and one that signifies to the readers of Scripture that something juicy is coming. So remember, Luke's crowd knew the Bible, right? They would be like, aha, people are on a mountain. Something good is about to happen. And sure enough, Moses and Elijah show up. Now, as the current disciples of Christ struggle to stay awake, They just see Jesus chatting it up with Moses and Elijah about what he will accomplish in Jerusalem. That's how I feel the story. They look up and Jesus, Moses, and Elijah are like, yeah, and I got to go down to Jerusalem. I'm going to get crucified. And and they're just having this very real human conversation about the things that are to come. It's really remarkable. Now, you've heard me say before, that when reading scripture, look for what I call dying flags. Look for tales of the weird and dig in. So when you're, if you're looking at the water and you see a little orange flag, you're like, there's something there, something that's important. And in this case, it isn't like there's just a little dive flag quietly bobbing in the water that we may or may not notice. It is like the Titanic itself has risen up from the seafloor to sit atop the waves, challenging us to reconsider what is even possible when dealing with God. You can't miss it. Something is happening. Two other cosmic mountain climbers are just seemingly shooting the breeze with Christ about his coming victory over the grave. It's all very strange, this whole event. So we have to think. So one compelling understanding of the transfiguration story, hear me out, is that time only appears linear to those of us who so far have not experienced anything else. We feel like we live on a timeline, and that just must be how time works. It's a good supposition for people. But what is time to God? Who created it in the first place? Is it only showing us that bodies and souls are meant to be changed, or is it also time being transfigured for all of us to see? Are we not being invited to see that Jesus actually is standing still at the middle of it all, at the axis of creation? Now, what would happen 
If we choose to believe this strange story, not just as a singular event, a dot on the timeline of history, but as something profoundly cosmic, a mystery not meant to be solved or explained away as a metaphor, what happens if we simply choose to believe? I mean, we don't really know, right? Elijah meets God. Moses meets God. How do we know what happens in time when we meet, meet the creator of time? And you know, when we think about belief and how we're all supposed to be rational all the time, it's overrated. It really is. Because we live in this world that has a giant belief-shaped hole right in the middle of it. Or depending on what you want to call it, you could say that there is a God-shaped hole right in the middle with people standing on the precipice of this hole, throwing in all kinds of just junk. This hole that once contained mystery and the story arc of God. If you're a, a fan of English authors, you might remember that G.K. Chesterton once said, when people no longer believe in God, they don't believe in nothing. They just suddenly believe in anything, which I think we're seeing. As we're surrounded by conspiracy theorists, hatred of anything holy, a loss of transfiguration and transcendence in our world, we should ask ourselves, how is it all going? It hasn't gone great to decide not to believe, to let go of holy mystery, to assume that we should just explain everything away. So what would happen to us when instead of allowing Jesus to stand at the middle of our lives, as we've, as a culture, done, and we packed that God-shaped hole the center of our being with junk. We don't feel good either. Because the reality is, is that we were created to believe. We are created to transcend and to be transfigured. And so when we allow ourselves to take in things that are just junk, this detritus of unbelief is not inert. It's not like we've just filled ourselves with packing peanuts and everything is fine. It's not how it's working. Look around. This detritus of unbelief has its own power, and we are all vulnerable to it. Because we were meant to be changed. We were meant to be transformed. So I invite you to just trust God and try on a thought experiment. I'm going to be talking about transcendence and a few other themes in this month. So join me on this thought experiment. What would happen if you just laid down your modern or postmodern thought processes and chose to just believe rather than explain away the seemingly unbelievable and non-linear aspects of the Christian life? This world has done its best to train us to accept that things are just kind of meh. And there's nothing beyond what the eye can see. Don't even bother to try. We've been told to lower our standards and accept a mediocre understanding of God. So what happens if we say no to that and make room for the mystery of God's self-revelation to just blow our minds open? God is not meh. God is good. And the distance between meh and good is immeasurably vast and contains within it all sweetness. So like I said, this is going to be a two or maybe more part conversation on transcendence. Next week I'll be talking about that and the choices we get to make to have a more transcendent life. What we can do on our side of things to make it possible to experience our lives in a more mysterious and beautiful way. 
to actively participate in the transfiguring of our own lives so that we too can move from image to becoming what it is that God has dreamt for us to be, fully human, fully filled in with color, fully textured and imbued with grace, the likeness of God that God has in store for us is an invitation into beauty. Amen.